here. So take a seat. Welcome. Alrighty, everyone. Welcome to our session. This is Successful Strategies for Food Waste Reduction and Recovery. My name is Hannah Katz, and I'm Amjek's new Policy and Program Associate. I started in Jersey City with my career as the Compost Program Manager, and so this is right up my alley, and I'm excited to listen to what they have to say. Our first speaker today is Isaac Berg. 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 I have to make sure I say that right. Isaac Berg, and I have his bio here. I'm going to introduce him. Isaac received an MBA in 2017 from Boston University's Questrom School of Business and Energy and Environmental Sustainability. Isaac is a founding member and vice president of the New Jersey Composting Council, which advocates for better policy and education on organics recycling. The NJCC has been awarded both statewide DEP grants as well as private foundation grants. Isaac has served on the project teams for these grants, teaching these grants, teaching backyard composting, completing university-wide wa wa waste audits. Uh, sorry, my mouth is getting jumbled up because I am exhausted. <laughs> and writing official progress and final grant reports and worked collaboratively on university-wide educational programs designed to increase food scrap diversion. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming today. Thanks, Hannah. And before you get started, I'm just going to introduce our second speaker, Gina Cole. Gina is a longtime resident of Mount Laurel and has been involved in environmental issues since she was in high school. Gina earned her Bachelor's of Science degree in Environmental Biology and studied wildlife management in Kenya. Gina has been a member of the Mount Laurel Green Team since the beginning and chaired the team for several years. Under her leadership, the Green Team worked with the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts on several environmental projects in our local community. And she now serves on the Mount Laurel Environmental Commission and heads the Tri-County Sustainability Food Waste Committee. Welcome, Gina. And so today, we're going to have Isaac speaking first, and then we'll go to Gina. Take it away. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, so just as a note of full disclosure, I have a ton of slides. I'm going to just go through most of them, like, very rapidly. Um, but you know, we have a couple of events coming up in the next uh, week, even, uh, in case you want to get into more depth on any of these things. Next, this coming Wednesday, the 19th, we have our Organics Waste Management Summit at the Rutgers Eco Complex, which will have all different types of presentations on uh, compostable products and zero waste planning and uh, all different types of things. Um, and, you know, then the next day uh, we're working with Gina on a uh, food waste composting event, which is more sort of training on the science and if you really want to do it in your backyard or, you know, on a, on a you know, that level, um, really the nitty gritty on how to, you know, sort of, um, you know, get that done. So with that, I'll just kind of hop into it. And as I said, I'm going to go kind of quickly through these things. But if you want more depth, uh, and I would say with the, the, the summit, you know, we're charging a fee for that. Uh, you know, most towns will sponsor you to come. But if you can't, come up and talk with me after. If the cost is going to be prohibitive, uh, you know, we can work with you on that. So that's my little spiel. So we're going to go through a bunch of things, what the importance of educational programming, help uh, preparing to divert food waste, home options. We'll just, uh, we'll just hop right into it. So the NJC's mission is to advance composting and utilization for um, you know, the benefit of the environment uh, through advocacy, education, and research. We also have a sister nonprofit called the New Jersey Organics Recycling Foundation, which is solely focused on research and education, as opposed to the um, NJCC, which does some advocacy as well. Uh, and we'll get to why that's important uh, later. Um, so you want to divert food waste, right? Um, you have to do a number of things uh, when it comes to an educational campaign if you want to get started. So you have to tell people why is it important. If I'm asking you to scrape off your food waste, if I'm asking you to put a, a bucket that can get kind of you know smelly uh, somewhere in your house, I need to really tell you why it's important. I need to tell you what can be composted. Not every program is going to be the same. If you're doing it in your backyard, if you're doing a drop off, if you're doing you know all different types of programs, not all the things are going to be the same. If I have a commercial program, so at a at a school, at a university university, wherever, um, I need to be able to tell people what goes where. You saw today, they had the signage uh, there. We need to make it as simple as possible for people. Um, and then I need to do training with my staff, uh, students, who, 
whoever else. Uh, sometimes it's just within your household. I need to, you know, train the kids uh, what, what to do. Um, so an education program is going to be the start of any uh, compost program. So again, why is it important? Well, let's, let's dig into some of the data. So we're talking about 1.46 million tons of food waste generated in New Jersey. 89% um, of that was disposed of rather than recycled. Um, so food waste is almost 25% of the municipal solid waste that ends up in landfills and incinerators, and it's 45% when it comes to uh, landfills, uh, you know, when it comes to just uh, organic waste. Uh, so these are the types of things if you want your community, if you want your household to you know, start composting, you really need to hammer home with them. There's all different types of things. You know, uh, people talk about uh, methane capture. Um, you know, those are only 25%, uh, you know, effective or, or provide 25% release, I should say. So there's a huge, and, and here, it's just an unused valuable resource. When you produce compost, you have something that you can grow uh, food with, you have something you can rehabilitate your fields with, uh, do you know, stormwater uh, mitigation, all these different things. So if you're gonna start, you know, again, composting, if you're gonna start a program, tell people why, why you're doing it. Uh, this is just a you know, list of the different places that food waste is generated. Now, you'll see the biggest chunk there is uh, residential. So you could say, we really need to tacker, tackle the residential sector, or you could say 57% is coming from other places. So whichever one you wanna focus on, um, is sort of your up to you. Um, so again, that's you know, there's all different types of benefits of composting that you can highlight when you're starting your ed educational programming. Again, uh, you know, it, it helps rehabilitate the soil with the micro and macronutrients. Uh, you know, reduce uh, you know, increase infiltration and, and permeability. So there's all different types of benefits of composting that you can highlight when you're talking about um, your program. So again, part of your educational program is what do you accept? So this is, uh, I think, from the Ulster County uh, facility, and they have a, a very, uh, you know, easy to read chart. So it's, uh, you know, these are the things that can't be going in there. These are the things that can go in there. And it includes certified compostable packaging. Now that's going to be something that, you know, is, uh, either accepted or not accepted in certain programs when it comes to your backyard, you're usually not going to want to use compostable products. Some people can, very few. Um, but when you have a bigger program, you might have those. So when you're doing your educational program, you got to make it very clear what's acceptable. Uh, again, you want to have a waste station design, something that's very easy to look at and see, oh, this goes in where? I don't love the color scheme that they have here, but you know, I thought it was a decent example. Um, again, this this one is a little bitter. Uh, I prefer the green for the organics, uh, you know. But again, it's pictures. People can just look at it and then they know. All right, food waste, compostable paper. That's what goes where. You want to make it as simple as possible for people to know when they're, you know, what you want in what which, which places. So then you've got to prepare your kitchen. So whether you have an at-home kitchen or you have a, uh, you know, more industrial uh, kitchen, you're not going to go to the big, you know, composter every time you're preparing something. So when I'm, when I'm at home and I've got my food waste, I got a little bucket on the counter, I'm gonna you know, put all my things in there, I'm gonna put it in the bucket, and then maybe a couple days later, I'll put it in my composter. Uh, maybe it's raining today and I don't wanna get out there. So I have to have something, or it helps to have something uh, you know, on your ca countertop. Um, and then again, in the kitchen, you wanna make sure you have a station and you want to make it easy for people. People are not going to go out of their way generally. You and I might, but everybody else probably isn't. Um, so this is what it looks like when it ends up in a big industrial facility. Uh, you know, the question will be, is this, are those all compostable or are those contamination? 
In this case, it's all compostable. This is a very good program, and that's all going to end up in good soil. Um, this, is what, this is what it can look like in your backyard. Nice, good soil that can be used. Um, so again, I'll just kind of go through these quickly. I think most people in this room know about it. What do I need to get started? I need a, some sort of composting equipment. I need a collection slash container. I need my carbon source. The carbon source can be sometimes harder to come by. Depends what you want to use. This is sort of like using uh, wood pellets. Those are really good for composting. They really absorb it. But some people don't want to buy those. You can get them at a tractor supply store. But that's kind of up to you uh, what you use. You want to pre-mix it. You know, kind of get in there, uh, mix your carbons, your nitrogens, get small pieces. Whatever scale you're composting at, it's the same general idea. They're doing that with a lot bigger equipment at the bigger facilities, but it's the same general concept. Um, again, you're going to have your carbon to nitrogen ratios. We can get into those at one of those events that I was talking about. Uh, but that's just sort of, um, you know, the basics. So you got your carbons, your nit nitrogens, and oxygen. Composting is a aerobic process, so that's that's a big thing. Um, you know, when you have some people worry, well, what if, what if, what if it's going to smell and things like that? Well, if you do it well, if you have the right recipe, if you have the right amount of moisture, oxygen, temperature, you really should not get those odors. You should not get vectors, things like that, because that's something that you know people in the town are going to be worried about. What if we compost here? Is it going to, you know, attract all these things? The answer is, it shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, again, temperature is going to be big. I won't go over this too, too uh, in depth. You know, you just want to get it up to a certain temperature, ideally, and then it's going to sort of level off and then come down, and that's kind of how you know it's ready to go. Um, how much time? It can depend on you know what your feedstocks are, what your process is, uh, you know how much you're manipulating it, uh, what the temperatures are, all those different things. So anywhere from literally two months to two years um, depends. You know, and we'll go through some of the things later that can. Um, so if I have a tumbler like this. You see this one, it's insulated, it's metal, it's got locks, it's off the ground. And that's going to compost pretty well and it's going to compost pretty quickly. It's going to maintain temperatures, but it's kind of expensive. It's, it's metal, you know. Um, so, but th I guess the point here in this, this section is just there's a lot of different options for getting people started in composting. And, you know, you just want to present them sort of the, the pros and the cons. Uh, this is something we really uh, like. We're building one of these at Bergen Community College. It's aerated. Uh, you see these pipes here. It's blowing uh, air in, which really speeds along the process. Um, and so you can sort of build these on your own. Uh, they're a little more expensive, but they really, if you want to have a lot of material that's composted in the short, I don't know if anyone has any animals, uh, like, you know, uh, cows, whatever, horses, um, but those those are really good uh, for that kind of material especially, but you can build just one of those for like a individual household or a community garden and we'll get it, come back to community gardens in a little bit. Um, again, there's all different types of tumblers. You can buy these off Amazon. Uh, you know, you can buy a less expensive system. You can, uh, you know, but they're not going to work quite as well. They'll work well enough, but they're, you know, so. Um, all different types of systems. You can build some of them on your own. You can get an earth machine. A lot of counties offer the earth machine uh, at, you know, like 25 to $50 or something like that. So a lot of people like those. Um, so there's all different types of backyard composting options. Backyard composting is the most environmentally friendly version of composting uh, because you don't have to take it anywhere. It just composted on site. Um, but not everybody has backyard. Not everybody uh, wants to get out there and get their hands dirty. Um, you know, we were just talking about worms earlier. Not everybody wants to, uh, you know, see a worm. Uh, so. Um, this is one is built out of pallets that people just got from, uh, you know, their local stores, that kind of thing. Um, and the slots provide the oxygen mix? 
Yeah, I mean, sometimes if the slats are too, uh, you know, far apart, people will like sort of build things in there. But yeah, so you want you want to make sure that you're getting the right oxygen in there. Uh, you know, they you see on this one, they built a roof over it so that it protects it from the rain. You would put it in this one first, and then maybe you know the second pile, and you know. You can get a garden sifter uh, to sift out some of the things that maybe you don't want in there. Those, those are easy. You don't have to do that, but if you want to, this one they just built at home. Uh, you know, depends on the scale and things like that. So uh, you can build, use a compost spreader. So backyard composting, great option. You want to learn more about it, we're happy to teach you. Um, but again, some people can't do it. So that brings in the rules for composting here in New Jersey. So when I'm talking about the rules for composting in New Jersey, why do I have a picture of carrots at a community garden, you might ask? Well, if I'm a community garden and I grow these carrots and I decide, you know, they're really not any good, I need to dispose of them, uh, well, I can compost them. But as soon as I take those carrots home, I start to peel them and I bring them back to the community garden, the rules as they are say, I need a permit. Now chances are, will anybody catch you if you uh, are just doing carrot peels from a few people from the community garden? Maybe not. But that's what the rules are. So currently before the legislature is a bill that would exempt the community gardens uh, from that type of legislation, or from that type of permitting, I should say. Um, and so that would exclude them from air permits, water permits, and solid waste permits. Uh, and the idea there is to get some local community composting going. There's another bill that would exempt schools. So those are, um, if I have a school district, and let's say the high school wants to build, you know, uh, get a composter, uh, and they have excess capacity and they want the middle school or the, the uh, you know, um, elementary school to be able to bring their food waste to the high school and, and compost it. Uh, again, so you start to bring it from those schools, now you need a permit. Well, this is meant to, uh, you know, get rid of that. Um, so I would, you know, call your legislatures uh, New Jersey state legislatures and say, hey, we want to see these move forward. Uh, it just moved out of the uh, assembly committee, um, but now it's got to go through the Senate and all these things, so. The permitting process that doesn't apply to backyard composting, does it? No, no. The, it's the larger scale. Yeah, once you start bringing food waste from somewhere to another place, like if I'm a school and I want to uh, compost, as long as everything is generated on site, it's usually okay um, and doesn't go. But anytime you want to bring it from a, a house in the community to you know wherever, that's when um, you know. If you want to also think about um, you know, we don't have very many compost facilities in New Jersey. Uh, we need a lot more infrastructure here. Uh, if you want, if you have a program uh, where it's collecting the, the the food scraps in your community, it's probably taking it uh, somewhere that's a little further than you might like. Um, so we have a problem where a lot of local communities, and this is a problem for all environmental projects, don't really want to have these compost facilities in their uh, community. And if they're run properly, and if, if, if I have anything to say about it, they're gonna be run properly. Um, you know, the solid waste uh, committee, committee in your community needs to approve it. So I would say to, you know, call your solid waste uh, advisory council in the committee and say, hey, if we have a good application for, uh, you know, building a, a, a compost facility, let's let's move it forward. 
Um, so that's, that's, that's my thing. So it, it can be difficult in New Jersey to start a, a, a compost program uh, because of the lack of facilities. But there are pickup and drop off programs that are starting all over uh, the state. Uh, you see uh, we've got Jersey City, we've got uh, Glen Ridge there, Java's Compost, uh, Community Compost, uh, Green Bucket Compost, uh, Ridgewood is doing a program. Uh, there's uh, compost in your neighborhood. Um, so there's all different types of programs that are, are, are hopping up. Some of them offer uh, curbside. So you know you just put a five gallon bucket on the curbside and somebody will come pick it up. Some of them uh, are doing drop offs. So you'll have like a, something like that. So what is what are, what are the, some of those drop offs look like? Uh, they've got these different types of uh, you know structures and usually they're locked. And if you're part of the program, you'll get the, the code or whatever and you'll be able to drop off. Uh, or you'll have somebody come to your uh, house. The drop off is going to be a little more cost effective. Uh, the uh, you know pickup is going to be a lot easier. Um, well, what if you combine it with your regular municipal waste to recycling pickup? Uh, you can put them out simultaneously on that day. And that yeah, those those can be difficult. There's you can pick up both. Yeah, I mean, those those are a little complicated, so you need a specialized truck for uh, handling all the liquid that is uh, there with organics. Um, so it can be done. It has been done in other places, but we don't see a lot of it happening in New Jersey at the moment. Okay. So. Sorry uh, to interrupt. We'll have a question and answer uh, section after the process. Sorry. No, it's okay. Yeah, so then as I talked about, if you want to process things on site, you again don't necessarily need the permit. So these are a lot of things we've seen at corporate campuses, at schools, things like that. Uh, this one is at Princeton University. Uh, you know, got, you got one of those at like Merck. Uh, so you've got other things like that. Um, you've got some of these uh, which are more dehydrators. So they basically uh, just kind of get rid of the water from uh, the food waste, which makes it a lot less um, you know uh, heavy to transport uh, but I would just say to you if you're thinking about an on-site option just ask the uh, manufacturer what are they actually promising you are they promising you know a, a, a compost are they promising you a soil amendment and what is that soil amendment because the soil amendment depend it, it, it determines what you can use uh, the uh, end product for um, so let's talk about questions for your compost program. So, you know, if you're thinking about some sort of program, who's going to pay for it? Uh, is it going to be the residents? A lot of the curbside programs are residents pay for their own private town doesn't really have to worry about it. They can just do maybe an educational program. They can promote it a little bit, but they otherwise just let the private uh, hauler. Sometimes the town uh, will do, uh, you know, fully pay for it, and sometimes there's a subsidy. And that will depend in part on how you structure your waste in the town. If you're paying for waste already and you can divert some of that tonnage, it might make financial sense for you to provide a subsidy or pay for it yourself. Um, again, it comes back to what will you accept? Uh, are you wanting, is your uh, composter gonna accept those compostable products? Are they gonna accept all the you know, food waste? You know, what, what are they accepting? Um, you know, if you're starting a drop-off program, how many locations are you gonna set up? A lot of people set it up at the DPW, and those DPW have uh, locked yards that are only open at a certain time. So are you going to offer other drop-off locations that might be open and more accessible uh, at that time? Uh, where do you want it to go? Do you care if it goes to compost or uh, anaerobic digestion? Anaerobic digestion is a very good uh, you know, process that, that takes uh, you know, the food waste and turns it into methane that can be used for renewable natural gas and things like that, um, but some people prefer that it be used for compost. Uh, are you concerned about the distance that it's going? Um, you know, these are the questions you want to ask of whoever it is you, that you're talking about in, uh, for your program. And then, of course, do you want any of it back? 
So some of your residents are going to want compost that they can use in their backyards and their in their gardens, maybe in your community garden. Um, so that's a question you have to negotiate with your um, you know provider of. Uh, how much of it comes back and what's the process of that look like um, so those those are the types of questions you really want to ask when you're thinking about uh, starting a program um, you could start to do it yourself I won't spend a lot of time on this this is about a three-quarters of an acre facility um, so less than an acre uh, it's under the Queensboro Bridge there's uh, you know hotels near it uh, all these different things so it's it's not a nuisance to its neighbors uh, in New Jersey again there are some complicated uh, permitting rules that can be tough but if you're a municipality, if you have a three quarters of an acre, you know we can work with you to try and make this a reality. Um, so that is an option if you if if you're really feeling motivated. There are some costs involved. There are some ways to get funding for it, but but they can be difficult. Um, and then you know hopefully you're producing some compost. Um, you know there's all different types of ways you can use it. Uh, the, the, the these folks set up you know a sort of a hoop house uh, in their backyard. Um, you know, you can, all different types of applications that I won't really go through. Uh, you could do turf establishment, garden bed preparation, reclamation and remediation of soil, uh, nurseries, roadside. People don't always think about uh, these types of projects. Um, garden bed mulch, erosion control, you can see on this side, you know, it was not great and then they put some compost in and they were able to grow a, a bunch of plants um, rain gardens are big uh, you know I think there was a storm water uh, you know uh, presentation earlier today uh, compost are huge for rain gardens and erosion control um, turf top dressing all these different things landscape backfill mixes golf courses topsoil environmental media um, so yeah, I'll just say, you know, again, this is our uh, event that we have coming up on Wednesday. Uh, and then we have an event again on Thursday. We have speakers uh, from all across the state and country who are coming to join us. Uh, so uh, yeah, if you would like to uh, be part of that, please uh, let me know and we'll make sure to find a way to make that happen for you. Thank you so much, Isaac. Does anyone have any questions? Whenever you're ready. Sure. Hi, Isaac. Uh, Larry White from Help. Um, curious to know more about the built infrastructure for biogas in the state. Okay. Um, I, I'm really keen on that solution. Sure. Uh, so we currently have two anaerobic digestion facilities that are uh, up and running. Um, well, two, two that are accepting food waste. Um, one in Trenton, one in Elizabeth. Um, and, you know, they're, they're doing a great job there of producing gas. Uh, they're not doing as great a job of using that end product i'm not um, uh, but you know that's one thing that you can use as a holistic system of producing the gas now you have a solid turn that into compost use the compost so that's something that's something we promote is you know if you're going to use uh anaerobic digestion make sure you uh turn that uh, compost into uh, you know a, a usable product and and there are some some companies that are looking to open facilities that do do uh, that kind of thing so um, I'm from the New Jersey Highlands Coalition um, and uh, I mean I compost at home and we've done it forever and ever and ever and we have chickens which are great because then there's no animal waste that goes into our compost but We've had opposition in a couple of communities to the establishment of, of a commercial um, composting facility. I get the impression some of it is a lack of understanding of what is being proposed. But the sort of things that people say is that there's going to be massive truck traffic, that there's a leachate as a problem, that you don't know what is coming, that it's not just compost. I'm sure you run into this all the time. What is, how do you respond? Sure. Um, so, 
you know, we have one facility that's trying to get up and running uh, at this moment, and they've run into those exact issues. Is it in Mansfield? Um, I think so. Okay. Yeah. Because that's one that's in the Highlands, and uh, yeah, um, and so you know, one of the things is. We, we do the traffic studies, uh, and they, they show usually that they're really not adding that much uh, traffic. Um, and, and, but that doesn't seem to necessarily always persuade people. Um, people are convinced that you know, this is where New York City's compost is coming. Right, right, um, and so you know what we tr what, what what we try to um, do is just educate them as much as possible on what all the different benefits of composting are, um, and all the harm that is happening from not composting, um, and you know. Uh, that's one of the reasons I said, you know, call your solid waste advisory committee, because uh, they they're going to hear from those loud voices who you know don't want to see the composting, but they they really need to hear from the people who are saying, you know, this is something we need. This is important for our our town, for our community, for our state. Um, so that's 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 what you know we would really advise. So. But is, is it something that is local, or is this something being done in a very, is, it, is this a big scale thing that is bringing in compost from a very wide area? Um, it depends. <laughs> um, you know, right now we need as many programs to get started as we can. Uh, every community should be having some sort of food scrap program. And the sooner that there are facilities uh, that are permitted, they will trigger uh, food waste, the food waste law here in New Jersey, uh, which requires anyone over 52 tons a year to start, compo start uh, diverting from landfills and incinerators. Uh, but there aren't that many facilities that are triggering that law. Um, so you know, some of it is going from a decent distance, uh, but you know, our solid waste from Secaucus is right now being sent to uh, Ohio. So I, I, th I, think, I think if we can get it from, you know, Secaucus to let's say Andover, um, I think we're doing a better job. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 can, it can come from pretty local, and the more local it is, the better, absolutely. Uh, but I think we're still going to be doing a better job the more we see facilities open up, uh, the more local it will be. Um, you were talking about how like, you need the carbon source, and a lot of people use pellets. Mm -hmm. You use like, like leaves, or leaves like... That's acceptable too, that would work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can use pretty much any carbon source that you want. Uh, the question is, you know, if I use uh, leaves, are they dry, are they wet? What is the moisture content? Uh, if I'm using like newspapers or something like that, what is the print that's on, on there? You can usually find that out. You can Google it, like what does this paper use? Um, you know, usually it's fine. If, if I'm trying to use it for growing food versus if I'm trying to use it for my, you know, uh, lawn, I might want to think about different you know if my if my process is really um, well refined the more things I can put in there you know the, the the wood pellets which I can get at a tractor supply store they're gonna make things really easy they just absorb all that moisture uh, you know but if you don't want to go out and buy those I totally get it uh, I don't always do that either uh, I try and use whatever is around um, and sometimes it's a little harder, and you have to, you know, adjust your mixture. But um, yeah. And for growing food, are there things like you should watch out for? It's like not put in your compost. Um, it's more about getting the right balance and the right pH and things like that. Uh, depending on what you're growing, the vegetables can be a little more sensitive to differences and things like that. Uh, you can get a test for. If, if you're really concerned, you can get a test for like 30 bucks from Rutgers uh, that'll tell you those basic things. You just take a sample of whatever soil you're using. Um, so, cool. yeah. Thank you. So actually, I've been a member of a community garden where we had an open compost system. And uh, we were throwing in some juicery scraps because we didn't know about that little 
mm -hmm. that we were trying to get rid of. Uh, and we developed a rodent problem. I mean, it took good years, but this year we had a, a rodent problem. We still haven't completely eradicated them. So we shut down the composting entirely. So it pains me to throw my, I live in a condo, so it pains me to throw my vegetable scraps in the trash now. But um, what, what kind of a system would you recommend for a community garden, especially one that's just been through this rodent problem if we wanted to try to reestablish? Yeah, I mean that, um, you know, three bin system that I showed uh, that the pipes in it? with the pipes, that's really good. You know, it's gonna, um, you know, w because it's aerated, you can have aerated or non-aerated. Uh, the non-aerated is gonna be a little cheaper. Um, the aerated is gonna pr uh, process more quicker. Um, still turn that? I mean, our bins were so, so big, it was impossible for us physically to turn it. Yeah, so there's a couple ways you could do that. Uh, so there are slats that you can put in between the boxes and that you can just sort of move up and it goes between one and the other. Um, do you guys have design specs on your website or anything? Uh, we don't at the moment, uh, but we always are, uh, you know, uh, providing consulting and things like that. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of options. Um, you, you know, it's a... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, those are often attracted to different things. People often blame them on the compost, and it's like, oh, we have a, uh, you know, heat pipe that's coming over next to it or something, and the heat's attracting, uh, you know, the... Ra so, but also, well, you want to make sure that you're properly... Local construction that disturbed them and they came over, but... Right. Showed up in the compost. Right, and and and, and so we stayed for the smorgasbord of the tomatoes. And right, <laughs> and if and if you're not properly, you know, covering those and making sure that you know the open bin. I mean, there's only so much you can do with it. Right. Even if you're putting leaves in. Right. So yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you know, a, a closed bin is is a big you know thing yeah. for that. Um, so. All right. It does sound like you need smaller bins. Divide yeah. them smaller, and then. You could you know, cover them better right. with cardboard pizza boxes because you can't put those in recycling. So, yeah, I mean we we had some of that. We didn't have enough though to because we had all these juice scraps from the juice trees. Yeah, but we yeah. really need you know some kind of municipal system. But not a lot. Of support yeah, and I mean if you're working with the town. Ideally, then they're going to have wood scraps and other things that they can maybe put in there, put in there and you know you're not going to. Well, the university's probably going to ha have some. Yeah. So. Yeah, because they're be collecting brush and yeah, all year round. But I don't want to take up too yeah. much of Gina's time here. So. Thank you so much, Isaac. Thank you so much. So Isaac just gave us a great <laughs> overview of policies, procedures, and different resources we can use in New Jersey to improve our compost programs. Now we're going to have Gina speak to us today about food reduction options, various forms of media that you can turn to for food reduction, and best practices. And as she starts, I just want to ask you all uh, about a little, some little fun facts. Like, did you all know that if uh, all of the food waste that we dispose of in the country were its own country, it would be responsible for one third of all carbon greenhouse gas emissions, sorry, not carbon, carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions in the world. And so that shows us right there, and for a plethora of other reasons as to why composting is such a sustainable, important initiative for us to invest in. So Gina, take it away and tell us some more. Great, thank you. So we're going to talk about uh, managing your food waste at home, uh, so on a personal scale. And this is definitely a program that you can take and do in your community, even from an educational standpoint. That's what this is designed for. First, we're going to talk about what is food waste, right? So it is food intended for human consumption that is wasted or lost and refers not only to the food thrown away at home, not only from, but produce lost in the farming process, harvesting process, during transportation, and storage. So basically the whole supply chain. And that's where we didn't talk about, but that's where we needed to 
of a diversion type of program because you don't want to lose that. So some statistics, but um, Isaac had gone over a bunch of them already. So food waste is the single largest component sent to the landfills, which is, we already learned. 40% um, of the food produced is thrown away, which leads to resources being lost. We're losing 32% 30 per, of our fresh water and 20% of land use and 44% of energy uh, use. This equates to $250 billion globally every year. That's a large number that could be diverted to humanitarian efforts or any other kind of efforts, but it's just being wasted. No, the fresh water is because we, we needed that water to grow the food and we didn't use that food. So you wasted that water, right? So the top things that are being wasted is 40% of all the fresh fish that we buy, 20% of all dairy, 34% of all produce, and 25% of all eggs. So discussing managing your food waste at home. So the first place you really need to start is to shop with intention and a list. We tend to overbuy. Um, so if you have a family of four, you want to buy portions for a family of four, not a family of six. Hey, I'm Italian, I get it, <laughs> right? So we, we show our love through feeding people and we really have to change our mindset from that uh, and there are apps available for us to help us actually know how many portions we need to buy for our home or a party. So you could do it for either one. And it's just an app you can download on your phone. We're gonna get to know our refrigerator, because that's important. And then keeping food fresher longer with proper storage and some preservation and usage. All right, getting to know your refrigerator. So just the basics, the cold air sinks in your refrigerator. So the lower levels are the coldest levels. And that really needs to be for the things that are much more perishable. So your dairy and your meats should really be on your lower, lower levels. The warmest part of your refrigerator is your door because you keep opening it. <laughs> so you really should be storing uh, condiments and soft drinks. A lot of people store milk and butter on their door because the kids, it's easy to grab the thing, but you're, you're gonna be wasting that because it's gonna go f bad faster. And then the mysterious crisper drawers. What do we do with our crisper drawers? <laughs> so, Especially at the bottom of the floor. Right, so they are colder, and you are gonna put produce in them, right? So there's usually two per refrigerator, and it's designed that way, so you can set one for a low humidity and one for high humidity. You wanna set the one for low, and you wanna put fruit in there. And then when you bring your fruit home, you do not wanna keep it in those plastic bags that you've just put in there because that traps humidity. So fruit goes bad faster with higher humidity. Now vegetables, on the other hand, they really like the high humidity. So you want your greens and your fruit and your root vegetables to go in the high humidity crisper drawer. You would also wanna take a damp cloth and wrap your greens around there and, and you could put them in a plastic bag you know to keep them fresher um, and then on the same vein as the crisper drawers you want to have to know the proper ways to store things right so apples everybody knows well hopefully everybody knows <laughs> apples have a high content of ethylene gas which helps ripen other fruit and vegetables so you really want to keep those apples away from everything else you know to help things stay longer um, you want to have proper storage of your tomatoes and bananas you you want to leave those on the counter and that's really for a flavor if they are starting to go a little bad put them in the refrigerator because you'll get a, a, another day or two out of them um, potatoes and onions again you don't want to put those in the refrigerator but you do want to keep them in a cool dark place but you never want to store them together because together makes them rot faster. Um, so I use breathable um, bags and I keep them in two different bags that I keep in my pantry area.
but some people use baskets or whatever. I try to keep the light from touching them. You can place um, herbs and scallions and asparagus in a tall glass with a little bit of water in them when, and stick them in the refrigerator. So that will keep them fresher that way. When you get your asparagus home, I usually suggest that you just break them where they go. That way, it's almost like a fresh flower. When you, when you get a thing of flowers at home, um, from the store and you bring it home, you cut the ends, put them in a vase of water, the asparagus the same way. <laughs> Gina? Yeah? Just, uh, just personally, personal anecdote as a single person, I swear by the Debbie Meyer green bags. Yeah. And I put everything in there dry. And I usually, more often than not, throw a hunk of paper towel in with it. Yeah. I can keep produce for a better part of two weeks like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I just wa I wash them and reuse them. Yeah. That's a great system. Yeah. There's a lot of different systems out there. People also have been putting berries into mason jars, which also extends their, um, their life. So this... I have a few websites here that I have listed that have a lot of good tips, um, just like um, we were just talking about. Have you ever heard of the eat this first shelf? <laughs> so you want to create an eat this shelf um, first shelf in your refrigerator. Typically, you should do the, f the top shelf because it's the most visible because it's right here at eye level. This is where you're going to want to put your leftovers. You came home from the restaurant, you brought home some leftovers, you want to put them up there. This is what happens right now. You're putting them in the bottom and then they're getting slid all the way in the back and you find them two weeks later. <laughs> you know, so, so if you put them on this top shelf, you can see them. And the same thing with your fruits and vegetables. Okay, you're in your crisper drawers and you're seeing, oh, this apple's starting to get a little, you know, soft or wrinkly. Put it up on the shelf. That way people know, grab it, eat it, or turn it into something else, right? So that's what you want to do. You want to be able to look at that shelf and then see, can I come up with a recipe to use those bits and pieces of fruits and vegetables? Soups, stews, and pastas, and hashes are a catch-all. You can make anything out of those things, right? So you just put them in there and they don't have to be the same thing all the time because spices will bring you around the world. You have the same vegetables this week, but you made something that was Mexican. One, the next week you have the, pretty much the same vegetables because you know we're pretty much creatures of habit. We buy the same things all the time. Well, now this week you're like, oh, I have these, it's the same thing, but I don't want to have Mexican food again, so have Asian. <laughs> you know, so you can find stuff just by spicing it up. Uh, fruits and vegetables also work great as smoothies. Um, turning those leftovers, so my husband's famous for taking hamburger and fries that are left over, or steak or chicken, and turning it into a hash. You basically just chop it up, add some more onions and peppers in a frying pan and he tops it with an egg because to him everything is better with an egg on top of it so <laughs> um, but yeah you can also turn things into casseroles or whatever but you should be using up your leftovers if you're not going to just eat it the same way right you get bored you know so this is a way you just want to be able to turn them into different things also, you start thinking about making small batch chutneys, uh, jams, or quick pickles. This is all for refrigeration, not um, long-term preservation, right? You have a handful of tomatoes. It's tomato season, you know, in the summertime you're inundated. I don't know if you garden, I do. I get inundated with tomatoes. Uh, so you just want to turn it into a quick chutney or maybe you only have a half a, a quart of strawberries left. You can make a quick refrigerator jam that you're going to use on your toast next week right and it's going to still be good quick pickles are another thing that are very easy i tend to buy cucumbers when i want to make a salad and i i realize i bought too many <laughs> cucumbers <laughs> before they're going to go bad i slice them really thin on a mandolin add some rice wine vinegar um, and some salt and pepper and some other seasonings and i have you know, a side dish now, because it's a cucumber dish. My husband throws it on a hot dog. He says it's the best topping he's ever had on a hot dog. So, 
also some of the things with the chutneys you can also make um, hot dishes and add some meat to it or an egg and then you have a full meal of course don't forget about your freezer something's starting to go bad you just throw it in the freezer <laughs> real quick and then pull it back out in three to six months hopefully um, so but this concept for your refrigerator does work for your pantry as well so we all know things go in that pantry and never come back out <laughs> <laughs> so if you see those items you want to pull them out um, out front and then start to think about what can I make with this I bought it for some reason so and that goes into our next slide on taking inventory of your staples so you want to before you go shopping shop your refrigerator and your pantry because you probably have what you need for a whole week you know or you just need one item so then you go into the grocery store you're getting you know a few things and not a whole uh, list of things so I would recommend every three to six months you do the investigation of the back of your pantry <laughs> um, so you can figure out you know sometimes cans of soup go back there and they don't ever see the light of day you know so bring them out you can make soup or you can make casserole <laughs> if you have the condensed soups. Um, cans of vegetables, you can turn those into the same thing. Uh, and condiments. My husband must, he has an obsession with mustard. I mean, literally has 10 different mustards open at any time. And then he has another 10 different ones in the pantry. So sometimes I have to say, no more mustard. <laughs> and that's okay, too. <laughs> so you just want to, you know, he goes, he'll be at the store and be like, I need this type of mustard. I'm like, I'm pretty sure you have that type of mustard in the pantry. So let's check first. <laughs> so, and then the freezer. We're going to go back to the freezer the dig deep you're gonna have to do it every once in a while i know we don't like to do it but you opened up that bag of peas and then you close it up because you only used half of it and you stuck it in the freezer and then it get back further and further <laughs> and further into the freezer you want to every once in a while just go in there and pull it out you can use those vegetables for making a casserole do a stir fry or you can even make soup and stock where it, maybe you just want to make vegetable stock for some other dish you're going to do next week use those vegetables that are half opened in the freezer and stick them in there make a stock out of them real quick and then you have a whole nother dish later that week we also tend to put some of our leftovers in the freezer and then we forget about them so you want to find those you found that chili you're like yeah i got chili have some lunch you know add a salad have it for dinner but use those up too you want to you don't want to leave those in there for too long three to six months is about right um so right we all lose sight of those items so it's always good to have an inventory and one last tip i would say about your freezer is that chalkboard contact paper can be your best friend <laughs> you stick it on the side of the, the refrigerator you write down with chalk what goes in and then you erase what comes out so you have an idea because you're always thinking oh i'm gonna have chicken for dinner oh, i looked in the freezer i didn't see any but if the chalkboard says it's in the freezer it's probably all the way in the back and then you'll find it or if you have a chest freezer it's probably at the bottom of the chest freezer and you just gotta dig in there and get it out but the chalkboard uh, contact paper makes it really easy i i do this <laughs> so it's a nice tip then there's preservation for long-term storage i know this can be scary to some people the first one's very easy you could just turn bread into <coughs> breadcrumbs really you just dry it out dry it out in the oven you don't need a fancy dehydrator but that's the word dehydrating it right and then you can make your own breadcrumbs. I don't buy bread crumbs in the store. I always have bread. I can always just dry it out and make breadcrumbs if I need it for a dish. Um, learning how to pickle and ferment is also a great way to extend the life of your fruits and vegetables. I know that that sounds scary, but it really isn't. And I would suggest if fermenting was something that you wanted to do, sauerkraut's probably the easiest thing in the world to make and that's where i always suggest people to start 
all you need is the cabbage and some salt. <laughs> yeah, you put them two together, you rub them, you just block out the oxygen and it ferments in two weeks. You will never buy sauerkraut from the store ever again. This is how I started fermenting with sauerkraut. I only did it, only started like two years ago. My husband says he will never buy, he's German, he eats a lot of sauerkraut. He's like, he called it power kraut because the taste is so much more flavorful and better for you because it's full of probiotics because uh, it hasn't gone through the processing of uh, pasteurization that you got from the store. Also dehydrating herbs. You, when you grow in the summertime, you get, you know, I don't know if anybody has an herb garden, but you can be inundated with basil and other herbs, <laughs> parsley. This too does not need a special dehydrator. All you have to do is just hold it upside down, hang it from somewhere and it'll dry. Um, so you don't really need to have special equipment. I'll tell you right now, if you do this, if you grow herbs, if you're not drying them for winter use, you're missing out because the stuff you buy in the store, even if you buy the high quality stuff, does not taste like the stuff that you just dried from your garden that summer. Then trimmings or scraps, you know, like, okay, we're making fajitas for dinner. We have peppers and we have onions. We're gonna cut them up. We have that one spot with the stem and we have the root end of the uh, onion. Those are what we're calling trimmings or scraps. I like to work, like the word trimmings better than scraps, right? Cause scraps sound like it's garbage. <laughs> so what you do is you just take these, throw them in a Ziploc bag and put them in the freezer. And once you have a full Ziploc bag full, you can then make stock with that. Yeah, so I always have a bag going. My husband also knows to put chicken bones in there too, and then we can have chicken, chicken stock that way. Uh, so it, it is a really easy um, way of using up everything before it becomes wasted. This uh, Zero Waste Chef, she has an incredible blog and lots of recipes on how to use your scraps. So if you want to find out a few quick tips on using some of them, that's a great site to go to. And you can, she does do a lot of um, talks. So if you wanted to book her for your township, um, your green team was having an event, you can zoom, have her zoom in. She, I just went to one that Philly uh, tra Talks Trash did that she was at and she was fantastic. We're gonna go real quick on the dates on the labels. These have no meanings, people. These aren't even regulated by the FDA or the USDA. The only one that is regulated is infant formula. So you have to use your common sense with these. You just want to smell them, taste them, and see if they're still good. I've used yogurt like a month and after its expiry. Yeah, yes, you can. <laughs> you can quote me. <laughs> this is New Jersey uh, DEP's new food waste. Um, they have a new food waste uh, subcommittee themselves. So this is their poster. Use it in social media. But it basically touch spaces on everything that we just talked about. Um, using uh, shopping your refrigerator first, eating your leftovers. Dates have no meaning. You could use, look, the government just told me it had no meaning. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so you want to avoid buying in bulk and then donate excess food. If you do grow a lot of excess vegetables, donate it to your neighbors, donate it to a local food bank. There is a, um, good Samaritan law that protects you. So you should feel safe to do that. And then last resort, we compost. <laughs> so I'm not gonna go over composting because Isaac did it, but these are the many ways you can compost in your, your personally. Backyard, vermicomposting, which is with worms if you wanna do it inside. There are devices that you can do it right on your countertop. You don't even have to go out back, but I don't know how good they, I, I do it out back, so. <laughs> uh, no interest in composting yourself? Find a pickup service if your township doesn't do it. Um, because as we heard from Isaac, there's an infrastructure issue, right? And lastly, 
we want to get out there and educate and, and have outreach with our community. So uh, again, I'm with the Tri-County Sustainable Food Waste Reduction Committee. This is our Discord channel. Uh, if you want to join our chat, we do meet uh, the fourth Tuesday of every month, uh, and I can get you the information. I have a toolkit that I have available for managing food waste at home that everybody can have and it does have some of those references on there. And this is social media. You want to create some social media blasts. Just use, you could use the Erase Food Waste New Jersey. That's the hashtag created by New Jersey DEP. Create your own. This is the one we have. Wasted to plated. And what I do under that one is when I do my bits and pieces and I create a new dish, that's what I do. Hashtag that. And then this is what you want to do for your as environmental commissions or green teams, you want to hold workshops. You want to hold them on prevention of food waste, diversion of the food, and then proper storage and composting. On the proper storage, I know I talked about some things that were a little scary, but bring in a culinary expert, someone who'll teach people how to do it the safe way. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Does anyone have any questions for Gina that they'd like to ask before we wrap it up? Just uh, don't put your freezer in the basement. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's gone forever. <laughs> Good tip. <laughs> right. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? As some of you may know, in 2021, the United Nations Environment Assembly made a priority uh, to address sustainable production and consumption. And that's being addressed throughout the entire world in every industry, from levels of government to schools to the household. And even though much of that relies on businesses and governments being more responsible, what Gina and Isaac talked about today is one powerful way that you can make a difference in your own home and help the environment in such a way that would change the entire world. So thank you so much, Isaac, and thank you so much, Gina, for coming by today thank and you. giving us this wonderful information. And if you all would like to exchange contact information or get some materials, Gina has laid out a few forms here for you all to take. And please feel free to network now. Thank, Thank you so you. much. I'll, I'll just say one thing real quick. So I went and did that whole presentation.